Um, I want to thank him. I want to thank the Family Resource Center just for even thanking enough of me um, to, to be your keynote um, speaker today. Um, I always wanted to do this, and I, 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 get an, I get a chance to speak to different groups all the time, you know, from corporations to kids to single moms, et cetera, et cetera, but I've never had the privilege and honor to speak to a room full of men. And despite the titles, despite the intro, what they didn't tell you in the intro, they talk about the successes, but I don't want to speak to you from that perspective today. I want to speak to you from more of my failures, more of my vulnerabilities, because at the end of the day, basketball is what I do. It's not who I am. And I'm a man first, and I'm a father second. And it's a high priority of mine, and I really take that extremely serious. And I wanted to come here today because just the mere fact that you guys are here means that you're ready and trying to improve and enhance your quality of life so you can better your family. And I think that's a consistent parallel that we all have amongst us all. This is a slide that um, is near and dear to my heart. On the left is my, well on my left is my oldest daughter, Brooke, and on my right is my son, Lavelle Jr. I'll take you on this journey, so just bear with me a little bit. I thank God that he gave me a vision beyond my present set of circumstances because where I'm from, a lot of people don't make it out. I know some of you guys weren't here earlier, but we had the opportunity to have Michael Bivens, and you guys are really familiar with the group New Edition. But that's all we really had where I was from. Mike and I are from the same housing projects in Boston, Massachusetts. And I was really fortunate because I had a praying grandmother. And when I was young, my grandmother was a really spiritual lady. She went to church five, six times a week. And she always made me pray with her at the end of the night. And we would be on our knees and I would just have one eye open peeping at her. And she ended every prayer with, in God, please bless my kids' kids. And this is my mother right here. And this is actually my favorite picture of my mom and I. As you can see, I got on a football helmet. She got on a, a, a fireman hat. I'm sure there's a football somewhere around. But she was my everything growing up. And we live in a place called Boston, Massachusetts. And this is our exact housing project apartment. So I always hear people say they started from the bottom, but I don't know what their bottom was, but this is, this is more like a real bottom. And at an early age in Boston, things were hectic, things became crazy. I didn't have any vision. I didn't know what I was gonna be. I didn't know what I wanted to be. Honestly, people expected you to live fast, die young, and in between have all the fun that you possibly could have. But I said this before, for those of you who weren't here, I said again, my life changed because I was fortunate. From that housing project, I discovered that, and some of y'all may be too young to remember, a lady by the name of Donna Summer came from our project. And she was the queen of disco. I won't really end the disco, but I knew I could make it out. And then these five young guys that stayed across the street and two of them stayed beside me by the name of New Edition also came from this project. And my mother showed me them on Soul Train one day. And once I saw them on Soul Train in their white suits, I immediately said that's what I wanted to be. I went through the projects, I grabbed four of my friends and we were gonna be called the next edition. So <laughs> it, it's funny now, trust me, at the time it seemed like a perfect idea, man. Like it, it was crazy. <laughs> I remember seeing them on Soul Train, and then after Soul Train went off, I went to the park, and they were at the park. And we just went wild. It was like, yo, how y'all get from Soul Train to the park so fast? And <laughs> like, we, we were just losing. We didn't know anything about tape delay, none of that stuff, because no one had cable. But at the time, my father was Haitian. He was from Port-au-Prince. And my recollection of him, he was a great guy. And what happened in Boston, they would have these things called rent parties. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with them. But rent parties was pretty much when someone struggled to pay their rent, so their friends would turn their homes into a nightclub and treat it just like a nightclub. And you'll pay entry and everybody just come over. And at the end of the night, they give the money to the person that was in financial need. I hated rent parties because everyone came to our house and they bought their kids. So that means I'm sharing a, a project room with my brother already, and now I got 20 more kids in my room, and I actually hated it. So, one night, we having a rent party for my mother's friend, and I just remember my father coming in with a thick accent, and he's slamming the kids on the bed, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm four years old. He said, 
Look, I'm about to break. I'm about to go to the store, what y'all want. Um, we had orders all day. We had honey buns and jungle juices and non laters Y'all remember all the candy things, right? So 30 minutes, is, he's gone, and then 30 minutes turn into an hour. An hour turns into two hours. And then I eventually fall asleep. And when I wake up the next day, I selfishly go to my mom and I ask her, like, where's, where's my dad at? But I won't ask him for his whereabouts and his safety. I was asking because I wanted my honey bun and my jungle juice <laughs> and my non lady. And the next thing she said to me kind of took me for a shock. I said, Mom, where, where's, where's my daddy at? And she said, he gone. And he ain't coming back. That was her exact words to me. And I didn't really know what that meant. He gone and he ain't coming back because he, he had never disappeared like this. The following month, it's my birthday, it's June. I hear a loud knock at the door, it's like a police knock, boom, boom, boom. I go to the door, I look out the door, I don't see anyone. I look on this exact doorstep right here, and there's a blue bicycle with a note attached that said, Happy Birthday Puffy. I knew it was from him because we had discussed him buying me that bike a couple of months ago for my birthday. But instead of grabbing the bike initially, I'm looking around because I don't see him. And what he did, I guess he knocked on the door and just, just dipped and left the bike out there. So I take the bike and I bring it into the house and my mom, I tell my mom, I said, mom, this, this, this bike is from daddy. I said, when is, where he go, when he coming back? And she looked me dead in my face again and this time with that look, and we all as kids have looked in our mother's eyes to see this look has never been generated before. And she said, didn't I tell you he's gone? and he's not coming back. So the following week, my godmother, Boston is starting to get crazy now. My godmother is tied up by this gang as part of the initiation, and she set on fire. My mother's supposed to have been with her that night at a third shift job, but she didn't go because she was feeling good, so my, wasn't feeling good. So my mom decided we got to move, and we're going to come into uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. That's how we resided down here. And my grandmother was down here, so we moved from Boston to another project. And at that particular time, the year is probably 1983, there's not a lot of black representation on TV. It's not a lot of people that look like me or my family. It's not a, people that, a lot of people that think like me or my family. It's not a lot of people that act like me or my family. But that changed. We, bought, we got a, a, a new television, and we only had three channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. That was the three channels right there. And I became a name it with this show. It was a show called Good Times. And I don't think y'all understand the impact that Good Times had on my life. I was more of a James Evans type of guy, not a Heathcliff Huxtable. I didn't understand the Huxtable way of living. But in terms of Good Times, that was the first family that I saw on television that was a representation of myself that I could really identify with. I loved Michael. I thought JJ was hilarious. I really loved Thelma. <laughs> really? Like that's, man, I, I mean that. That's, cut the cameras off on that one. I don't want my wife getting that one, but I, I really love Thelma, for real. But I was drawn to the presence of this father. And in our housing project on Lane Street in Raleigh, if you knock on 400 doors, it wouldn't be a single man to come to either home. So I became enamored about James Evans. He was a strong guy. He was a hardworking guy. He didn't take any nonsense whatsoever. He was a provider. He was a protector. And to the point I fell in love with the show because it came on every day at five. My mom knew I was obsessed with the show, so she went out and bought me a Good Times pajama set. And she bought it too big. It had the feet in them so I could grow in them. But she bought it too big, so each year, whenever I grew, she would just take the scissors and cut the feet out. <laughs> or whatever. So probably after about three or four years, I had a good times onesie on, because it was, I was like, Ma, you got to take this off. It had the, the JJ on the chest with dynamite and everything. But I was really, I was really infatuated with good times. And James Evans became the only father that I'd known at that time, and he became the father for our entire neighborhood. And then the following year, I'm sitting in my home, and I see, I see some young guys in here, and the phone is ringing. And this is 1984. And I don't remember what I wore yesterday, but I remember dates. I take these mental notes and I remember and I apply them to my life. And I never forget, it was April 1st, 1984. And the phone is ringing, 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 and ringing. And for you young guys out here, this was pre-answering machine, 
pre the cell phone. And back then, your phone would ring, and there was only two ways that phone would start ringing. Either the person that was calling would hang up, or you would answer it. But it was going to ring, or you was going to answer it. And my mom told me when the phone rings, she's like, uh, get the phone, tell whoever it is I ain't here. Y'all remember that? <laughs> so I pick up the phone, and it's ringing like 45 times back to back, and I'm like, whoa. I get the phone, and it's my mother's uh, girlfriend, Flo. And she said, Puffy, where, where's your mom? I said, she, she said, she's not here. <laughs> and she said, she said, boy, you better go get that phone to her, because Flo stayed across the street, so she saw our car there. She said, you better go get that phone to her. So I said, Mom, Flo on the phone. So my mom is coming to the phone, and it was one of them long cords that stretched all the way from the kitchen <laughs> to the living room. Y'all y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, some of y'all with me, right? And I gave my mom the phone. And my mom is on the phone, and now she has a concerned look on her face. And all I hear is her reply, like, what? Girl, stop. You're lying. And then she covers the phone, and she say, Puffy, go to your grandma's house and tell your grandma Marvin Gaye just died. My grandmother stayed two blocks away. So I, for you young boys, again, once again, not only was I the phone answerer, I was the email guy, too. <laughs> So I ran two blocks to deliver this news. And I get to my grandmother's house, and she's in the kitchen, and I'll never forget. And I just bust in the door. I'm like, Grandma, Grandma. And she was like, boy, what's wrong with you? I was like, Mom told me to tell you Marvin Gaye just died. And she said, what? So she stopped doing what she's doing. She took off her apron, and she went and cut on her television. And I think it was Dan Rather or somebody. They're doing a story right there on Marvin Gaye. And I'm sitting in my grandmother's arms. And for all you young guys in here, even you older guys, this is the most profound message I ever had in my life when I'm watching this TV. They're saying Marvin Gaye has passed away, and they're having a moment of silence for him. And as they're going to break, they have his picture on the screen. And they're fading away. And it said, Marvin Gaye, April 2nd, 1939, to April 1st, 1984. And it's a moment of silence. And my grandmother said, see, I want you to learn something right now. And I'm nine years old at this moment. She said, you see, his, his birthday, like, that don't really matter. His death date, that don't really matter. The only thing I want you to worry about is that dash that's in between. Because that dash in between represents his impact that he had on people. That represents his legacy. And that's why I want you to know that the two most important days of your life, grandson, is the day that you were born and the day that you figure out why. And that's why I make you say your name and spell your name, because when you leave this earth, I want that dash to have some kind of legacy. And that was the biggest lesson. <laughs> that was the biggest lesson that I had ever learned in my life. And my grandmother didn't have a formal education. I think she dropped out of school in fourth grade. And then the following year, the most tragic thing happened in my life. It's March 1st, 1985, OK? I never forget these dates. I walk in our home, I walk in our apartment, and the door is halfway cracked, and it's pitch dark. And my first reaction is, damn, somebody done broke in our house again. Because a week prior to, someone had broken into our home. In this particular evening, the door is open, and I'm like, wow, I don't even want to go in here because I'm thinking someone is in here. But I hear someone crying like a baby in my home. And I have a brother that's five years older, but it's just me, my brother, and my mom. House is pitch dark. I walk in the home. I cut on the light in the kitchen. No one's in there. I cut on the light in the living room. No one's in there. I go in my room. No one's in there. And then I hear this big cry coming from my mother's room. I go in her room. And I cut on the light, and my mother's on the floor crying like a baby. At the time, I'm 10. I got down on the floor, and I helped her. I, and my shirt was soaking wet because she was crying like a three-year-old kid. 
And at the time, she had this phone book. I just picked up the phone book and called everybody. They was asking me what was wrong. And I told them, my grandmother passed. Because I knew that was the only thing that could make my mom cry like that. It was at that very moment I hated my father because he left us, he left us in a precarious situation to go out here and fight this world. And he left us. He was nowhere to be around. I just felt as a 10-year-old boy, I shouldn't have to live in the moment this way, because that was his job to hold my mom and not mine. I made a promise to my mom that day that I'm going to get you out of this situation. If you just stay strong and continue to do what you need to do. But I promise I will move you out of these projects and somewhere have you never work again. From that moment on, my life took a turn. I kind of took a walk on the wild side. At that time, it was the inception of crack cocaine. I got involved. And some stuff I probably shouldn't have got involved with. I saw one of my childhood friends in here, and I'm not gonna call him out, but um, he knows. I could go to his house and lift up his mattress and get an AK-47, 357, Glock, semi-weapons, it doesn't matter. That's the neighborhood that we were living in. Two of my friends, was convicted of first degree murder. And the cops was knocking at my door because I was with them 30 minutes prior to the situation. My only alibi at the time was I left because I wanted to go home and watch Good Times. It's funny how God works. As we're in high school, my grades are slipping. I don't care anymore. Because I felt if the man that created me didn't love me enough to stay, why would anyone else? I had no confidence, no security. Um, ladies, I know you see a fine specimen up here now. <laughs> but, but, but um, it won't like that back in the day. I promise you that. Um, I'm sitting in class one day in high school and I'm, I'm starting to gravitate towards mentors. My mentor, Ron Williams, was at the boys club. He did a phenomenal job of intervening and just helping me and promising my mom I'm going to get this kid off the streets. He has a special gift. I'm sitting in class and the cops, one day we went to North Hills and this one stonewashed jeans came out. And I liked this girl in school, and I heard her tell this boy at lunch, I like your stonewashed jeans. <laughs> this is the silliest mess I'm up here talking about. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to go to North Hills and get me some stonewashed jeans. <laughs> but I ain't, they were $35. I ain't had $35. So we went to North Hills, and um, we stole some stonewashed jeans, me and my boy. And I got caught. And the cops is coming to my school the following day. And I'm in the classroom, and I see him walk directly across from my 
class and they're looking for me and they go to my guidance counselor. And she calls me in there, second period. She said, do you know the cops are looking for you? And I said, um, yeah. And she was like, um, I told them you're a super kid and you just need some guidance and some help. And I assured them that if they left you alone and just talk to you, that I'll work with you and we'll get you through high school. They took me down to the station. <laughs> they took me down to the police station and they did the scare tactic. But I was already done with the scare tactic because my mother had already called John Baker and I was like on the first episode of Scared Straight. He took me down, <laughs> he took me down to the jail and said, son, this is where you're gonna end up. And after seeing that, I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. So the cops took me down to the, to the station. They said, you want me to call your mama or you want me to go to jail? I said, take me to jail. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> please don't, cause my mama would've came in there wrong, you know. <laughs> y'all know, y'all know. So, just wrong, just <laughs> happy birthday, Ma, I love you, but good gracious. <laughs> So I was fortunate because my high school coach, Frank Williams, took me under his arms. And he was a disciplinary, and he didn't play. We had to run five miles before practice. He made us wear a belt up to our waist. He said, you're not going to be sagging. How you dress is how you're going to be addressed. You're going to be respectable young men, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm so grateful for him. And I entered the walls of North Carolina Central in 1992. And when I entered North Carolina Central, the first thing I did I took the program, I asked to see the sports information director, and I took the program and I said, um, who's the all-time scoring leader? I said, who's the all-time assist leader? And he said, the person you probably need to chase instead of all those questions is, is Mr. Sam Jones. And I was already familiar with Sam Jones because he was a Boston Celtics, obviously I was from Boston. And I told my mom, I said, um, I want you to keep this program because I'm gonna break all of his records. And I want my jersey to be honored and up on that wall. She's like, that's Sam Jones. I'm like, I don't care who it is. I'm going to get it. And I'm proud to say that last year, well, February 5th to be exact, um, my jersey was retired for breaking Sam Jones <laughs> records. But the most amazing thing, it wasn't the basketball or the jersey or nothing like that. The most important thing to all you fathers out there was just having my kids out there with me. All my life I fought for my name. And my son walked in and he said, like when they unveiled the jersey, he said like, Daddy, look, they got my name up there. I was like, hold, <laughs> hold, hold on. Like, hold on, boy. Like, hold on, I love you, but good Lord. But just for him to feel that, that meant the world to me because I always wanted to leave a name where the Moten name could be respected because the more research I, I, I did, I found out that my father left, his father left him. And then his father left him. So it was just a cycle, a cycle of dysfunction. And I come from a dysfunctional family. I'm, I'm not as proud to say it, but when my grandmother passed, my mom is the youngest of six. It hurt so bad, my mother didn't, my mother haven't spoken to her sister since March 1st, 1985. That's a true story. So it was like a real episode of Soul Food, except I was the little boy that couldn't get everybody back together with Soul Food. And it's been continuing and continuing. And I'm telling all these grown folks that you're kind of hurting the family because my children don't even know who their cousins is and God forbid what happened. So I'm trying to restore that myself and I just tried to do that through a name. Um, okay. Our first championship came in 2014. And it was the highlight of my life at that particular time. Like, it was the first time in five years, well, in years that North Carolina Central had ever been to the NCAA tournament. It was an incredible moment for me. We're cutting down the nets. Thank you so much. <laughs> It was, it was a joyous, incredible moment. I can't even begin to explain. I started my coaching career making $200 a month. So for me to now get to this 
this stage. It was the grandest of all grand. And we were scheduled to leave to go to Texas on Tuesday. But we celebrate on Saturday. We do the NCAA selection show on Sunday. And then on Monday, my, I get this call from my wife. My wife said, my mother's keeping my son at the time. And my wife says, your mom just called and said, um, VJ spilled coffee on himself, but he's OK. And that didn't sit well with me. And not to take anything from my mom, but I'm sure a lot of y'all grew up under these circumstances now. It's a lot of, it's an urgent care on every block, almost. We weren't doing no urgent cares when I was young. So I just thought that, OK, my mom saying he's OK, let me go home and check this. Because when we played, we didn't have any health insurance. So she just told us, don't go out there and get hurt, because I can't afford to take you to. <laughs> and that was our urgent care right there. That's how urgent it was. So I drive home, and I, it's one of those moments, man. I, my mom is holding my son, and he spilled coffee on the top of his head, and it's, it's ran all the way down his face. And he kind of looks like a hot cheese sandwich. That's what he looks like. So I immediately was like, Mom, what in the world? So I grab my son, and I'm running, I'm rushing to the urgent care. And I'm calling my wife on the way there, and she says, uh, I'll meet you there. And she walks in, and she sees her son, and she collapsed on the floor. And they said, we can't do nothing from him here. You got to take him to the burn center. So I'm rushing and getting this child to the burn center. As soon as we get there, they take solution, put him on the rag, wipe his face, and all his skin come out. And he goes from my complexion to Michael Jackson's complexion, the older Michael Jackson. And this is on Monday, and we're scheduled to leave on Tuesday. And now I'm at the hospital, and I'm looking at this kid, and I'm watching this kid, and I just end up calling my chancellor and my athletic director, and I said, I'm not going. They're like, what you mean? And I wanted to keep it low key because I know how the media is. You know, we'll be the worst parents ever if, if it got out. I said, I'm not going, and I ended up telling them. And they said, well, we're praying for you. If you want to go, you go. If not, you don't. And at that moment, I really didn't know what to do but sit there with my son. And my wife, being the strongest woman ever, God knows, Lord. I wanted Thelma, but I, I had to have this one right here. <laughs> she, she rubbed my hand and she said, let me tell you something. She said, I know what this means to you. And she said, um, you always tell your team they got to be strong during adverse situations. So now it's time that you walk that walk. She said, you go coach and go win this basketball game, and I'll stay here with him. And I told her I'm not going. Because at that moment, I felt like if I walked out, I would be my father. Y'all got the crying guest speaker I've ever seen in my own life. Yo, man, I'm not coming back, man. Man, took all that boy towel. So she said, I know that, but she said, you're always going to be here, and your father not here. So she said, you go win that game. We go to the game, I promise you, I don't remember seven plays from the game. I'm just on the sidelines. It's breaking news, TNT, everyone is announcing it. It's all on the media, et cetera, et cetera. But that picture that I just showed you is of me holding him when I got back from the game. Because when we left, I just caught the first thing smoking, and I just wanted to get back to my son because I didn't want him to Google me in 10 years and see that his father left him over a basketball game because that wouldn't make me any different from my father. I don't know the purpose of this picture, <laughs> but that's my family. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was moving, and um, 
we was packing up all our stuff, but before we left, we was at the home. And my daughter was at my mother's house. And all of a sudden, they're coming into our door. And it's kind of like the scene from What's Love Got to Do With It with Annie Mae and Ike when they got out the limo. That's exactly how it is. And my, my daughter's coming in the, in the house, and she's busting the door open. She's crying. I was like, girl, what's wrong with you? She's like, me mom won't let me ride that bike. That's all she said. My daughter's four or five at the time. And my mom is like 10 yards behind her. <laughs> it's like, I don't care if you're telling on me, go. On. It, it, like, it's, it's crazy. She's like, I don't care. Go on, go on. Ask him, can you ride the bike? I was like, what are you talking about? My daughter was like, me mom won't let me ride that blue bike at her house. And I'm looking at my mom like, what blue bike are you talking about? And she said, ask him, can you ride it? And she's like, daddy, that blue bike at me and my house, can I ride that bike? And my mom gave me the look like, yeah, that one. And now it becomes my Heathcliff Huxtable moment. Because I realize now the bike that she's talking about, the same bike my father left me. I never rode that bike. It still had the ribbon on it, still had part of the note on it. At five years old, I never rode that bike. I just took it with us because I wanted it to become an artifact to kind of fuel me, to kind of inspire me, to kind of let me know even though you walked out, I'm going to succeed anyway. And I didn't want to ride that bike, really, because if I ever rode that bike, that, was, that would be saying, I accept you leaving out of my life. And I just wasn't willing to do that. I'm a Gemini, I hold grudges. And so my daughter didn't understand, and I, I'm telling her all this. I said, baby, my father wasn't there the way your father is. She's like, what, so why can't I ride that bike? I said, well, anybody with the last name Moten would never be able to ride that bike. And I said, it's for obvious reasons. And now my wife and my mom is coming into the equation. They say, look, man, you've, you've held that bike for 37 years. You, you've proven your point. It's time to let it go. And so, I'm still working on that. They think I threw it away. <laughs> Send a storage unit. Right. Send a storage unit. Yeah, they still don't know that. But it's in a storage unit because I always collected this data because I wanted artifacts to promote and to fuel myself and to inspire me each and every single day of my life. So, as we leave here today, I didn't want to speak to you from a father perspective. I wanted to talk to you from the four-year-old who obviously had a hole in his soul because his father had left. And I ask you, and I challenge you, to ask yourself, what does manhood look like for you? I know it's difficult, and I, I love this quote. It says, I thought about quitting until I noticed who was watching. For every man in here, trust me, I understand your pain. <laughs> like, please don't look at me on no TV and think, I don't feel your pain. I understand. I understand the daily grind. I understand the disappointments. I understand the fact that some men don't want to get married because they think marriage has nothing to offer them. They think you lose your name, respect your friends, your sex life. And even if it don't work, you may lose your family. I understand that. I was talking to a good friend of mine, Mr. David Banner, and I told him, I said, bruh, men, black men are like field goal kickers. He was like, what? I said, black men are like field goal kickers. He said, what does that mean? I said, I don't care what your favorite NFL team is, and I'm a Steelers fan for life. Right? I don't care what your favorite NFL team is. You don't know the name of your field goal kicker. I said, the field goal kicker's job is when they score a touchdown, come on, kick the extra point. When they get a field goal position, he just come out and kick. When they score a touchdown, he just kick off. We only know the field goal kicker's name when he mess up. He gets no credit otherwise. When he, d when he kicks the ball through the uprights, oh, he's supposed to do that. I love my wife to death. But fellas, let's be honest, it's what we signed up for. When I bring home $300, $400 worth of groceries, I don't get a, oh baby, you the best. Like, I don't get that. <laughs> now if any of y'all get that, let me know. But I don't, I don't get that. 
My point is, when you do things, you can't be a man when you want to be and not be a man when you got to be. That's a certain level of responsibility that we all signed up for, whether we like it or not. And when you say you are head of a household, that has a great bearing over its name. And that's your utmost responsibility. So just because you become a father, I don't want you to diminish your dreams. Like, and make your dreams about someone other than you. I always tell people, I give people advice, I say, look, you want to achieve your dreams, make it. My dreams was never about me, right? Because when your dreams are about you, you had a propensity to quit on yourself. Y'all know that. How many diets have you started and stopped? <laughs> How many resolutions have you started and stopped? Why? Because your dream was about you. But when you're looking through the eyes <laughs> of your mother and your daughter and your son, and you got to uphold that dream for them, I promise you won't quit on them. But I understand your pain. I understand everything that you're going through. And that's why I wanted to come here. Even on my birthday, I felt like it was more of a blessing for me to be here. So I ask you, what does manhood look like? And the second thing I tell you, stop comparing yourself to another man. Like, we got egos, right? And it's, it's a sense of competition every time. And I don't want you comparing your life to another man's, especially with this social media out here. Now you're comparing your process to his highlight reel. And that's very unfair. And when your fellow brother achieves something, be happy for him. Like, you... <laughs> nothing will ever come to you if you can't be excited for someone else to have it. And that's the God's honest truth. Everybody always say, man, coach, I want to be you. Don't say that. You, you, don't want, you don't want this pain. And I don't want anybody else's pain. Because y'all can all come up here and have similar stories where you have a room full of tears. But my point is, what God has for you, he has for you. And if it's nothing that I've learned, I know you're trying to do, because I do it too. I'm gone so long, we try to catch up and try to purchase our, our daughter. My son's favorite pair of shoes, and he's living a very privileged life. He ain't living in that project that I was in. His favorite pair of shoes are the shoes where you stomp and they light up. They $8. <laughs> That's my man's. So you don't have to go out here and try to purchase a $150 pair of Jordans to buy that. Because guess what? Kids don't remember that. Kids remember time and your presence. That's what kids are going to remember. And if you can do anything, and as Kim said, every time you see me, I don't care. At, after the game with the press conference, I got my kids on my lap. Because when I was in that hospital, won't nobody around there, won't nobody there for me. So I'm always gonna keep them side by side in my lap and let them know that I love them unconditionally. And that's what I want you guys to do. And I'll end by saying this. When I walked in, a young man, I can't see him in here, but he was like, Coach, man, just, man, I'm struggling with this fatherhood thing. Like, what advice do you have for me? And I want to address that, and I want to tell you guys the same thing, man. It's very simple. Don't make this thing complicated. Be the man that you needed when you were younger. That's fatherhood. That's fatherhood. So before I go, I ask that each man in here raise their right hand real fast for me. Put it over your left pocket and feel your heartbeat. And once you feel your heartbeat, I want you to understand that's purpose. God has you here for a reason. Don't let him down. Don't let your family down. Thank you so much. My name is Lavelle Moton, L-E-V-E-L-L-E-M-O-T-O-N. Thank you.